Hollywood, the Lawrence Welk Network presents the big band sound of Lawrence Welk. One, two, and... Uh... In the early days of this century, before movies and television, we were entertained by small groups of musicians who traveled from town to town. In less than a decade, small bands became large orchestras, and the big band era was, so to speak, in full swing. Lawrence Welk was very much a part of that scene, working his way up from five guys to a 22-piece orchestra. It was our good fortune to be members of that group, and he made us part of an American musical legacy. From time to time on The Welk Show, we did special saluting the big bands, and we'd like to share some of those good times with you. Looking back at the golden age of big band music. Myron met Mr. Welk in St. Louis in 1950 and was invited to join the Champagne Music Makers right on the spot. A dream come true for a young man from South Dakota. My own dream began when my mother took me to the movies to see the Glenn Miller Orchestra. And right up there on the screen was my cousin Ernie Caceres playing the saxophone. From that very day, I worked hard to become part of a big band. I have been with the Lawrence Welk Show since 1972, and I'm happy to report that on the tours I play around the country, the big band sound is still very much alive. I've been with Lawrence since 1948. So I have a few years on these guys. I had been working since 1942 and had played with Les Elgart, Glenn Gray, and then Elliot Lawrence. We were playing opposite the Welk Band in Chicago, and when Lawrence found out his trombone player was leaving, he spent three days trying to hire me. Finally, Mr. Welk said he was going to New York to follow Guy Lombardo for 12 or 16 weeks. Now, I'd been on the road for 200 days straight, and I said, if you were going to hell for that long, I'd take the job. <laughs> I've spent the last 40 years of my life playing great music for a man who was in on the beginning of the big band era. The big band era was in full swing when this film was made. Art Hickman had formed a band in 1913, Fred Waring and Ted Lewis had started bands in 1916, and Paul Whiteman in 1918. Whiteman's first engagement was at the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco. 
but he quickly moved to New York and on to fame and fortune. They called him the king of jazz, but it was really symphonic jazz. One of his signature songs was this one, When Day Is Done, and it was played by a large group of his well-known former sidemen at his funeral service in 1967. The 1920s were an important training ground for future band leaders. Mr. Walk had his own band from 1927 on, traveling all over the Midwest and playing to a huge audience on a powerful regional radio station in North Dakota. Jimmy and Tommy Dorsey were working for Paul Whiteman. Benny Goodman was working with Ted Lewis, Red Nichols, and most of the popular band leaders of the day. When Prohibition was repealed in 1933, the band business really came into its own. The speakeasies became respectable, and the big hotels got their crowds back. It was the middle of the Depression, and Benny started his band in 1934. He pepped up the tempos, cut the breast section loose, and created swing music. Benny Goodman was possibly the greatest influence to come out of the big band era, and set the musical pattern for years to come. traditional Jewish melody, adapted by Siggy Alma in 1939, with lyrics by Johnny Mercer, was featured in two musical films about the popular band leader, and the Angels Sing, starring Betty Hutton and the Benny Goodman story with Steve Allen. Dorsey Brothers organized their own band in 1934. Tommy was the leader and one of the three trombones along with Glenn Miller, who also was the arranger. Jimmy played the lead in the saxophone trio, and George Bow, who later played with the Walk Band, was the only trumpet player. It didn't last long, however, just a little more than a year. Musical differences of opinion and the clash of their personalities were the reasons Tommy walked out on the band. Jimmy became leader, and Tommy quickly started his own raiding other bands for the best sidemen. It was another great band.
went to Hollywood to play on the Bing Crosby radio show and became pretty well buried as far as the rest of the country went. And because of this, didn't have time to travel around the country like other bands. By the middle 50s, Jimmy was on top of the hill once again when his version of So Rare became the biggest recording hit of his career. Bobby Dorsey wasn't the only one starting a band in 1935. Three other important groups got going, Woody Herman, Bob Crosby, and Russ Morgan. Now you know as a trombonist myself, Tommy Dorsey was my idol. I thought he was just great, and Russ Morgan knew he was stiff competition, so he decided to play more middle-of-the-road stuff. Anyway, one night Tommy and Russ had a double band date. And Tommy said, I'm more famous and bigger than you, Russ, so you go on and warm them up for me, and I'll go on last. Well, that really ticked Russ, so he went out and bought an off-white suit and glasses just like Dorsey's. And he played all of Tommy's biggest hits for the crowd. Well, you can imagine how the hot-tempered Irishman Mr. Dorsey reacted to that. Anyway, Russ had a reputation for having the best chops in the business, and when I recorded Bye Bye Blues years ago, and whenever I did it on the show, I was thinking of Mr. Russ Morgan.
Crosby had taken over what was left of the Ben Pollock band, and they began to play some pretty good Dixieland jazz. That was Lawrence's favorite kind of music, and a tribute to the big bands wouldn't be complete without the Crosby version of South Rampart Street Parade. Crosby had another big hit called Big Noise from Winnetka, named after a loud bunch of college kids from Chicago. Here it is with Art Duncan tapping out the Bob Haggard bass solos. I'm called the Big Noise from Winnetka. I've got rhythm in my feet. I'm called the Big Noise from Winnetka. And I never miss a beat. Gentlemen, here's a step that Lawrence Welk taught me. The Lawrence Welk strut. Here's another Lawrence Welk step. This one's called the horse and buggy step or meanwhile back at the farm. In 1937, another one of the great all-time influences on the big band era formed his own orchestra. Glenn Miller had been a top musician and arranger since the early 20s and was responsible for the success of many other bands, so he decided to try it on his own. As the world headed into a war, he recognized the need for people to dance together. So he took beautiful melodies, gave them his distinctive sound with the saxophone and the clarinet doubling, and the American public just loved it. Lawrence used to say, play Glenn Miller and you're already on third base, and he was right. Glenn Miller had his own band for just about six years, but what an impact he had. Then he was gone, missing in action on his way to Paris. The 30s decade was truly the golden age of dance bands. Goodman, the Dorseys, Woody Herman, Artie Shaw, Harry James, and so many more. It was a very American art form too, and Glenn Miller made the most of it. Only he could take a traditional march and make it swing.
Girl vocalists may have been window dressing at first, but band leaders quickly discovered that they were crowd pleasers too. Let's start with lots of pretty girls and a Les Brown tune. Gonna take a sentimental journey. Gonna set my heart at ease. Gonna make a sentimental journey. To Got my bag, I got my reservation. Spent each dime I could afford. Just like a child in wild anticipation. Long to hear that all aboard. Seven. Girl singers were a traditional part of the big bands. Lawrence had one as far back as 1932. Boy singers came a little later because in the beginning, they were usually just band members drafted to sing a few songs. But singers added some variety to the evening and little by little, they became more important. Being a big band singer was important to a career too. If you could get with a band, you could get a record, get on radio and you were on your way. Peggy Lee, Rosemary Clooney, Doris Day, Perry Como, Mel Torme, Tony Bennett, and many others all started with a big band. Vocalists were always young, mostly talented, and sometimes they had a great gimmick, like we Bonnie Baker, who sang with the Oren Tucker Band in 1939. crazy about a certain little lad although he's very very bad he could be oh so good when he wanted to bad or good he understood about love and other things for every girl in town followed him around just to hold his hand and sing oh John Johnny, how you can love. Oh, Johnny, oh, Johnny, heaven's above. You make my sad heart jump for joy. And when you're near, I just can't sit still a minute. And so, oh, Johnny, oh, Johnny, Tell me, dear, what makes me love you so? Well, you're not handsome, it's true, but when I look at you, I just don't judge. Kay Kaiser had a great band and a popular radio show. The key was entertainment, and his singers were cute kids, Ginny Sims and Harry Babbitt. Who wouldn't love you? Who wouldn't care? You're so enchanting, people must stare. You're the dream the dreamers want to dream about. You're the breath of spring that lovers gab about or mad about. Who wouldn't love you? Who wouldn't buy the west side of heaven if you winked your eye? You're the answer to my every prayer, darling. Who would love you? Who wouldn't care? 
Who wouldn't love you? Who wouldn't care? You're so enchanting, people must stare. You're the dream that dreamers often dream about. You're the breath of spring that lovers gab about or mad about. Who wouldn't love you? Who wouldn't buy the west side of heaven if you winked your eye? You're the answer to my every prayer, darling. Who wouldn't love you? Who wouldn't care? You're the answer to my every prayer. Bing Crosby was a singer for Paul Whiteman and Gus Arnheim in his pre-Hollywood days. He and a group called the Rhythm Boys had a lot of fun with this number. The sun goes down, the tide goes out, folks gather round and they all begin to shout. Oh, oh, it's a treat to beat your feet on the Mississippi mud. It's a treat to beat your feet on the Mississippi mud. What a dance do they do? Lordy, how I'm telling you, boy, they don't need no band. No, no. They keep the time by clapping their hands. Yeah, yeah. They're just as happy as a cow chewing on a cut when the folks beat their feet on the Mississippi mud. Lordy, how they play it. Goodness, how they sway it. Uncle Joe, Uncle Jim, how they pound the mire with vigor and vim. Boy, that music thrills me. Joy, it nearly kills me. What a show! What a show! Oh, oh. Go, go. As they beat it out, either fast or slow. The sun goes down, the tide goes out. The folks gather round and they all begin to shout. Hey, hey, Uncle Duck, it's a treat to beat your feet on the Mississippi mud. It's a treat to beat your feet on the Mississippi mud. What a dance do they do? Lordy, how I'm telling you. Now, they don't need no band. No, no. They keep the time by clapping their hands. Yeah, yeah. Just as happy as a cow chewing on a cud when the people beat their feet. When the people beat their feet. On the M I double S I double S I double P I. Mississippi. On the Mississippi mud. Mississippi mud. In case you haven't guessed it by now, I always was and still am a big Tommy Dorsey fan. Not only could he blow a great horn, he put together bands that could knock your socks off with talent. He also knew how to choose good singers and how to use them just right in the program. If you had gone to see Tommy in the early 40s, the singers would have been Frank Sinatra, Joe Stafford and the Pied Pipers, and they would definitely have done their latest record, which was Sinatra's first big hit. Sinatra left Tommy and was replaced by Dick Haynes. 
Joe Stafford stayed around for a little longer and recorded more hits like this one. It comes out if it's in you. Yes, indeed. Oh, yeah. Makes you shine. Jack, it's in you. Yes, indeed. Woo! When that jive starts jumping, you shout. Well, let me in there. Well, all right. When it hits you. Jimmy Dorsey had a good eye and ear for talent. Helen O'Connell and Bob Eberly may have been one of the best duos in the big band era. Soft lights and eyes that promise sweet nights bring to my soul a longing, a thirst for love divine. In dreams I seem to hold you, to bind you and enfold you. And our hearts too with a thrill so sublime those cool and limpid green eyes a pool wherein my love lies so deep that in my searching for happiness I fear that they will ever haunt me all through my life they'll taunt me but will they ever My soul a longing, a thirst for love divine. In dreams I seem to hold you, to find you and enfold you. Our lips meet and our hearts too, with a thrill so sublime. Those cool and limpid green eyes, a fool wearing my love lies. So deep that in my Searching for happiness, I fear that they will ever haunt me. All through my life, they'll taunt me, but will they ever want me? Green eyes make my dreams come true. That they will ever. with Helen at Norman Lear's home in 1987, and she was terrific. She made lots of hit records with Jimmy, and we played many of them that day, including this Spanish song that they had revived in 1941. <laughs>
In the early 50s, Joe Stafford had a big hit with the nostalgic sound of a big band and a pretty girl singing in a spotlight. See the pyramids along the Nile. Watch the sunrise on a tropic eye. Just remember, darling, all the while you belong to me. See the marketplace in old Algiers. Send me photographs and souvenirs. Just remember when a dream appears. the movie I told you about earlier, where I saw my cousin Ernie with the Glen Miller Orchestra? Well, it was Sun Valley Serenade, and it featured the great song Chattanooga Choo Choo. Pardon me, boy, is that the Chattanooga Choo Choo? Track 29. Hey, you can give me a shine. I can afford to board a Chattanooga Choo Choo. I got my fare and just a trifle to spare. You leave the Pennsylvania Station about a quarter to four. Read a magazine and then you're ready for more. Chattanooga Choo Choo, 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 Chattanooga Choo Choo,
drugs They greet you Come on down Forget your care Come on down You'll find me there So long town I'm heading for Tuxedo Junction now Paul Whiteman was the first band leader to hire a female vocalist as a regular attraction and the first to feature a large vocal group as part of his band. His most famous concert was held on February 12, 1924 in New York City. He was promoting a concert to introduce new music to the American public and he wasn't disappointed. George Gershwin wrote a concerto, not a traditional one, but one with the feelings of 1920s jazz. It was arranged by Ferdy Grothay with Gershwin at the piano and Whiteman conducting. The concert made musical history, and the song they introduced was, of course, the Rhapsody in Blue. and welcome to a program of big band memories. And we get things underway with Henry Cuesta, the band and singers, and a song made so very, very popular by the great band leader and showman, Ted Lewis.
A song when my baby smiles at me and Ted Lewis are locked together in musical history, not because he was one of the lyric writers, but because it became his theme song. You can think of one without the other. Today's bands do not really have themes. They are recognized by their latest hit song. But in the days of the big bands, each one had a signature melody. It all began when they started playing on the radio and they needed a song or a gimmick that identified them immediately before the listener had a chance to touch the dial. So it became a real challenge to find a good theme. Maybe that's why so many of the great melodies have survived the test of time. Even if you have never heard of Glenn Miller or know what instrument he played, you have heard his music played in his own distinctive style. Now here's a test of your big band IQ. What is the Glenn Miller theme? String of pearls? In the mood? Neither one. It's Moonlight Serenade. popular trumpet solo from the Big Ben era was the melody associated with Clyde McCoy. His horn seemed to be talking to you when he played Sugar Blues. most famous trumpet artist from the big band days was Harry James, who chose a turn of the century Italian melody for his theme. <laughs> knows for sure who was the first to use the theme song. Some say it was the Kansas City Nighthawks. Others feel that Ben Burney made the practice popular. Ben had a real good band, and as a kid, I used to stand outside the door at the Hotel Sherman in Chicago and listen to him do his radio show. There was a dollar cover charge, and in those days, that was like a 20. Anyway, Ben was a great entertainer, a comedian with a big cigar, and he used to open every broadcast with his trademark song. Yowza, yowza, yowza. Good evening, this is your old maestro, Ben Burney, coming to you from the College Inn at the Sherman Hotel in Chicago. It's a lonesome old town when you're not around. I'm lonely as I can be. It's a lonesome old town When you're not around How I wish you'd come back to me I never knew how much I'd miss you But now I can plainly see It's a lonesome old town when you're not around. 
ground How I wish you'd come back to me Frankie Carl wrote the music for his theme song in 1939 while he was still just a featured pianist with other bands. Duke Ellington was already a legend playing big band jazz at the Cotton Club. Take the A Train, written in 1941 by Billy Strayhorn, was one of his biggest hit records and it became his trademark. Charlie Barnett, who was influenced by Duke Ellington, took a song written by an English band leader named Ray Noble, turned it into his biggest hit record and his theme, Cherokee. Latin songs have always been favorites of mine, and I still play a lot of them. But in the big band era, the South American sound belonged to one man, Xavier Cugat. He was the first and best known Latin American band leader and was a big star on radio and in the movies. His big break came when he got a contract to appear as one of three regular bands on a coast-to-coast -coast radio show in the mid-30s. Cugat had a long and enormously successful career, influencing everyone from Perez Prado to Linda Ronstadt. He wrote the music for his theme song, My Shawl, and hired two lyricists, one for English and one for Spanish. <laughs>
Artie Shaw didn't specialize in Latin rhythms, but his recording of Cole Porter's Begin the Begin with its South of the Border beat made him a rival for Benny Goodman's King of Swing crowd. There were some great small groups in the big band days, too. The Three Sons were a dynamic trio with an unforgettable theme song. When Lawrence was getting started, a disc jockey in Pittsburgh told him that his music was as light and sparkling as champagne, and the band had a new title. When Shirley Welk arrived, her father wrote a song for her called It Bubbles in the Wine, and a theme song was born too. At the start of his career, Woody Herman's title was the band that plays the blues. That all changed with the coming of the first herd in the early 40s. Lawrence's all-time favorite big band theme song was the Woodchopper's Ball, and we all loved to play it.
At the height of the swing era, dozens of bands were nationally famous, but not all of them were truly dance bands. Men such as Count Basie, Duke Ellington, and Artie Shaw were rightly considered jazz performers, even though they frequently played for dances. When the era ended, they were the ones who easily made the transition to concert dates, tours, and appearances at jazz festivals. Duke Ellington was in a class by himself and for nearly half a century led a band that uniquely and brilliantly interpreted his material. When we wanted to salute him, we went all the way back in his career to Ring Them Bells, written by the Duke in 1930, and we recreated it exactly as he recorded it. I grew up listening to Duke Ellington, and his arrangements were always original and always interesting, so it was fairly easy for me to imitate his style. One of my favorite Ellington numbers is Caravan, which he co-wrote with Juan Tizol in 1937. Its natural musical flow makes it a trombonist's dream. One night in 1947, playing opposite the Harry James Orchestra, Juan Tizo let me play his trombone. It was the most mellow horn I ever played, and that night is one of my best memories of the big band days. was a great pianist, bandleader, composer, arranger, and put it all together in Sophisticated Lady. Count Basie was second only to Duke Ellington for pure jazz originality, but second to no one for longevity. From his first band in 1935 to his death in 1984, he maintained a band of inspired musicians with a loyalty to the beat and the blues. Even though we played a more middle-of-the-road style, Lawrence admired and appreciated what the Count was doing, and when we did our big band shows, there was always a Basie number on our list. In 
1938, the year this number was written, Count Basie and Chick Webb played a double date at the Savoy Ballroom in New York City. It was a battle between two great swing bands. The audience that night was legendary, with Duke Ellington, Red Norville, Gene Krupa, Lionel Hampton, and the Benny Goodman family. At one in the morning, the master of ceremonies asked for the dancers to make their decision. The yelling and cheering for Basie was just a bit louder than for Chick Webb. The Basie band had everything going that night, including the inspiration for a hit, One O'Clock Jump. Artie Shaw, on our list of jazz greats, was always searching for new ideas. He was the first to use strings in swing music, introducing it in 1935. Looking for a different sound in the 40s, here is a song inspired by a vacation in Acapulco. see, Artie Shaw displayed his fine tone. Since Benny Goodman had already been crowned the King of Swing, Artie's musicians gave him the title King of the Clarinet. <laughs> Artie Shaw was also one of the first to feature a small group within the big band. He called them the Gramercy Five and one of their biggest hits was named after a street he lived on in Beverly Hills, Summit Ridge Drive. In late 1946, the post-war recession ended the big band era without so much as a round of applause. In a few months, Benny Goodman, Woody Herman, Tommy Dorsey, Benny Carter, Harry James, and Les Brown all disbanded. Some of these leaders later reformed with varying degrees of success, but it was never the same. Television changed American entertainment, and only Lawrence Welk was able to make the leap from the big band era to a regular and long-lasting series on TV. On special programs, we recreated the sounds of the big bands, but most of the time we were just ourselves, accompanying the Welk stars and doing our own numbers. To keep us on our toes, the boss would order brand new arrangements of good old standards like Stardust. We call this next number the epic version.
Throughout the years, we continued to salute band leaders like Perez Prado and the talented Doc Severinsen and his great Tonight Show band. It doesn't matter where I work, anywhere in the world, the big band sound is immediately recognized as being purely American. It was created here and set the stage for big bands and countries all over the globe. I'm proud to be a part of the Lawrence Walk legacy, keeping big band music alive and well. We were the lucky ones, able to make a living doing what we love best, playing with a great band week in and week out for so many years. Instead of crying about what happened to the dance band era, we're grateful that it lasted as long as it did. We're proud to be a part of a group that combined popularity with high musical standards. I still play over 200 band dates a year, and half of the musicians I meet are young men and women just out of college, and they're all interested in big band music. These kids who can play high C on a trumpet early in the morning are carrying on the tradition in fine style. We owe a lot to the great band leaders of the past, especially to Lawrence Welk, who almost single-handedly kept the American public listening and dancing to big band music. Let's drink a toast to the men and women of the big band era, and especially to Mr. Welk. 